don't judge something in the first three weeks, please. <laughs> like just give it time to settle in and work for you. And then let's make sure that by three weeks, you're starting to feel your body improve. And then around three months, we should be seeing some visible changes. It's probably not going to be this giant change. We're all about no quick fixes around here, but that's a really good benchmark to aim for. Welcome to the Wits and Weights podcast. I'm your host, Philip Pape, and this twice a week podcast is dedicated to helping you achieve physical self mastery by getting stronger, optimizing your nutrition, and upgrading your body composition. We'll uncover science backed strategies for movement, metabolism, muscle, and mindset with a skeptical eye on the fitness industry so you can look and feel your absolute best. Let's dive right in. Wits and Weights community, welcome to another episode of the Wits and Weights podcast. Today, I'm joined by fitness expert Megan Dahlman, who in her 17 years of training professionally has become the sought after trainer for women over 40 who want to feel their physical best for years to come. I brought her on the show to tackle the fun and often frustrating topic of belly fat, especially in women over 40. We'll separate fact from fiction. You'll learn about the physiological and hormonal changes that affect belly fat. And Megan will share four perhaps surprising, but as always, evidence-based strategies for reducing belly fat. Megan's insights will give you more confidence in tackling that midlife, what she calls fluff and top, whether you're looking to enhance your health or physique or better understand your body. With a degree in exercise science and as a certified strength and conditioning specialist, Megan has an uncanny ability for taking complicated aspects about your body and making them simple doable, and actually sustainable. We like that word here, sustainable. Through her top 1% podcast, Self Care Simplified, and online training programs and courses, she genuinely cares about every woman she interacts with and coaches with a unique attention to detail, grace, and patience. Ask any of her clients, and they'll say that Megan isn't just an outstanding trainer, but she's a phenomenal coach that truly cares. Megan's mission is to help every woman, no matter their age, feel strong, pain-free, and confident in all aspects of her body. Megan, it is a pleasure to have you on the show. Hello. Thank you. What an introduction. <laughs> I'm excited to be here. <laughs> That's a thing we do here, Megan. You know, I've been following your work for a bit now, and I loved immediately what I was hearing. Um, and what I was hearing was that you emphasize strength training and building muscle and a lot of the evidence-based st stuff that we talk about. But it's also, I'll say, nuanced and accessible at the same time especially for women who are just getting started, you know, you, you kind of take them along for the journey of it's okay, don't stress, you know, one step at a time. Tell us about your personal philosophy, your mission to help women get strong, pain-free and confident. Yeah, you know, I, I got my start as an athletic performance specialist. So training like high level athletes, and I always thought that that was so impressive. You know, what a cool thing to have on your resume to be like an Olympic trainer. And it was fun, but, but how it kind of evolved to who I work with now of primarily 40 plus year old women is I would train athletes. Many of them would be young that their parents would be in the wings watching and they'd be like, wait a second, can I work with you? Like that looks way more fun mm. and effective than the Zumba class I'm going to, than my jazzercise class, you know? And so it started evolving to training adults, kind of the general population of people who are like, I really want to move and operate and work like an athlete. Because when it comes down to it, that is how our bodies were created and designed to move, period. And so it's fun to bring things from this athletic world into the average individual and show them how amazing their body can operate. When we focus on those things that help you optimize the way that your body moves, the way your body functions on a daily life, on a daily basis, it's so exciting. And I think unfortunately in the fitness industry, there's this giant chasm between trainers and people who are really fit and athletic, who this is their life. They love it. They live it. They breathe it. Like they just know a lot about it. And unfortunately, the large majority of the population where fitness, good nutrition, taking care of your body is a foreign concept and really hard to do. And so I keep seeing that gap getting wider between 
people who are deep into the research and really into it and care about, I don't, I don't care what the studies say. I just, Mm. I want to be able to go through the day and not have my knees hurt. And so that's really my mission is to kind of fill in the gap and be, I will, I will bring the evidence-based work to you. I'll meet you where you are. I won't bog you down. I won't overwhelm you. I'll keep it as simple as possible. And in the long run, that's going to make it doable and sustainable and get you excited to keep going. So that's really the philosophy behind and, and my mission behind everything I do. I think the way you explained all that was the most succinct, direct way that I've ever heard for <laughs> what many of us are trying to do. Seriously. I mean, and I've interviewed a lot of people on this show, but a few things that stood out to me first, having trained athletes and then the general population saying, I want to be trained like that right there. That's great evidence that there is a gap and made me wonder, you know, why is that? Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And maybe we could explore that a little more. But you also said it's the way we're intended to move. And the word athlete as an identity is is very important to people. I found working with clients, um, men and women, but especially women, when we use that word, I'm like, you are an athlete. Like, No, I'm not. Yes, you are. And look how far we've come using the principles of an athlete of training and progression and performance and fueling yourself, all these positive things that you want to build and not, you know, do the restriction and all the other things that the industry talks about. And then you said there's still a giant chasm and it's getting bigger. So let's just explore that for a second. I know we'll get into the topic, but why is it getting bigger? Why is the evidence-based stuff not as accessible as it needs to be? Well, I think two things are happening right now. I think we have the people who are interested in health are starting to really dig deep. We're getting more and more um, studies that are coming out all the time. We're starting to get this whole like section of the population that's really interested in like biohacking methods and you know kind of those little final one to two percent tweaks, and and that starts to be really noisy, especially in the social media space because it catches a lot of attention. And then at the same time, we have the opposite end of the spectrum where the general population, America, is getting unhealthier and unhealthier. And I think the obesity rates right now in America is staggering. I think we're pushing 50%, not just being overweight, but literally obesity. And so these two things are happening. And it's just this, like people are getting, the healthy people are getting so so dialed in healthy, like it's almost obsessive and the unhealthy people are getting even unhealthier. And so there's such a big gap that nobody's like, when the unhealthy people are looking at what you need to do healthy to be healthier, that's what they're seeing. They're seeing the biohackers that are working on that final 1% tweak like cold plunging is not going to solve my <laughs> health issues. <laughs> How about red light therapy? Right, yes. right. You know. And it's like, yeah. and, and so then they try those biohacking things and it's like, well, that didn't work because that was so extreme and such this giant leap from where their life looks like today. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, that's a great way to put it. I, I think of food in that context as well, where you're not even eating whole foods or enough protein and and you're worried about grass-fed beef, right. you know, wagyu beef, whatever. It's like <laughs> just just get there from where you are today and it'll be a huge improvement, a step change. Okay, so now one of the things that uh, we're going to talk about today which is belly fat has has been in the space uh for a long time as one of those topics that I don't know, maybe it could be clickbaity or associated with the, the 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 training programs related to, you know, crunches and all sorts of crazy 1% solutions that you just talked about. Yeah. So we want to take a nuanced approach based on the evidence, but also that's accessible to everyone listening. Before we do, why is this even a topic? Hey there, it's Philip from Wits and Weights. We are running a special listener survey all this month of February, and I'd love your input. It's quick, easy, and a fantastic way to let us know what you love about the show and what you'd like to hear more of. Plus, as a thank you, everyone who completes the survey gets entered into a raffle for some awesome prizes, including first form supplement gift cards, one hour Zoom hangouts to ask me anything, and one year subscriptions to Macrofactor. Just head over to witsandweights.com slash survey or click the link in the show notes. This is your chance to shape the future of the Wits and Weights podcast. Again, go to witsandweights.com slash survey or click the link in the show notes. 
Thanks for tuning in. And now back to the show. I think because it is so aesthetically annoying, (laughs) for lack of a better term, Um, There's obviously all of the health-related issues with carrying excess body fat around your midsection. We know that having what's called visceral fat, especially the fat that is kind of intertwined around your organs, that is extremely unhealthy for your body. Your chances of having heart disease um, and diabetes, like they just go through the roof and all of these metabolic syndromes. When you have visceral fat, the type of fat that just gets lodged inside of your gut and inside of your torso, it's, it's more dangerous the, than the kind of fat that's more on your limbs. However, it, in addition to that, I, I have to say that the, the belly fat, this, this excess fat around the midsection, especially women, but I think men too, we have always had this discomfort with the way that our, our midsection looks. There's this like obsession with having a nice trim, svelte figure, you know, where we have a beautiful waist. And so anytime we feel like we're outside of that, where we feel like we're squishy or, or wide or thick around the midsection, we feel like we're not falling into the aesthetic norms of our culture. And that really aggravates us and makes us lose a lot of confidence in our body. And so whenever I'm helping coach people through this, it's like, let's really make sure that your intentions moving forward are more based on getting you as healthy and functionally fit as possible. And then we'll let the aesthetics fall where they lie. Because I find that when people come at it from a, from a, angle of, I just want to see my abs, or I just want to look good. It's a motivation that doesn't very often points you in the wrong direction. You kind of end up feeling like willing to do whatever it takes. And that tends to lead you down an unhealthy route. So if we can be pointed in the direction of like, okay, let me approach chat, like taking care of this belly fat from a, from the healthiest aspect possible from coming about it from as, as healthy as I can and get as healthy and fit as possible. And then let the aesthetics fall where they lie. You're going to have a much better time and, and get the results you really want. And and without damaging your body in the process. Yeah, that make, that makes a lot of sense because the athletic figure many people are going for is an outcome of many, many other things that it may not be a one-to-one uh, root cause or, or, you know, proximal cause. It's funny because I've just recently recorded an episode of mine coming out soon called Why I'm Getting Fluffy Before I Get Jacked. <laughs> and it, and it's, a, it's just a real honest conversation into my mind about my own fluffiness and belly fat as I gain weight, but I'm doing it on purpose. I know that the final outcome once I lose fat later on will reveal yeah. what I'm working at, but I'm not, I don't care because I, I'd rather get strong right now and I know it'll pay off. Just, just somewhat tangential. And from a male's perspective, we do have those um, insecurities as well. Yeah. Yeah. And it really is that mindset shift and be like, what do I really care about in the long run? Like maybe right on the surface, I say that I really care about, you know, having a really slim figure or having visible abs. But on the, in the whole, if I zoom out and say like, what do I really want for my body? Where do I want my body in five years, 10 years, 20 years? Do I want to have a body that has zero back and hip pain that I can say I have extremely dense bones through my spine? I don't have to worry about disc issues or functional issues. I can be fit and active and move like an athlete well into my 70s and 80s. I'm going to raise my hand to that all day long and say that that is a higher priority to me than being able to look great in a swimsuit. And I know I have to just trust that in the back of my head, me pursuing that long-term outcome is also going to achieve these more surface level goals that I also have for my aesthetics and be okay with that. And it just might take a little slower. And like you said, you might have a little fluff in the moment (laughs) when you're doing it the right way. (laughs) Sometimes it it doesn't happen the way we want it to. (laughs) 
It's true. And it, it depends on how much of that you want to accept during the various cycles of getting there. Yeah. And everybody, everybody's body is different. Genetics are different. Where you lose fat first or not d- changes, you know, men versus women, especially. And of course, the place that we gain fat first and it comes off last is the place we least want it to be. <laughs> often. Yes. Um, and when people ask about that, usually my response is it's probably just a, it's probably just a, what do you call it? Catch 22 in that that's where you've been seen it your whole life because you're prone to gaining the fat there. So let's, let's talk about, we do, we do need to address somewhat of the, um, the belly fat piece itself and what causes that since we know there is a health component, not just an aesthetic component, especially the hormonal changes. I want to get into that either during peri and post menopause or just in general. Tell, tell us about the connection. So as you enter perimenopause and then in those postmenopausal years, um, really what's going on is your estrogen production is declining. Your ovaries are simply not producing as much estrogen. There's other hormones involved too. Even in women, there's the progesterone and testosterone. Um, and then also in, in men, as, as men age, there's less testosterone production. But we're kind of talking mostly about the perimenopause and menopausal belly fat. Estrogen, I like to call it the magical hormone. (laughs) It does so many things in your body. It maintains muscle mass. Like it it keeps, it's like a little protector and shield around muscle mass loss. It, It manages your hunger. It actually is an appetite suppressant, a natural appetite suppressant. Estrogen actually helps provide energy and is a mood booster. So your motivation is often a lot higher during the time of the month when you have high levels of estrogen. You're more likely to want to get out there and, and get after it versus like hunker down and not really do much. Um, estrogen also keeps imp- inflammation at bay. It's an anti-inflammatory. So when we see of when we look at it like that, like, okay, these are all the wonderful things that estrogen does. Now we know on the flip side, when your body stops producing estrogen, all of these things now start to become a problem. We start to lose muscle mass. We have to work a little harder to maintain and even build muscle mass. Our hunger cues start to get all out of whack. We tend to be a little bit more hungry throughout the day. We don't have as as high of a mood. Our motivation it feels like a struggle. We don't have as much energy. We tend to be a little bit more inflamed throughout our body. So we might have some joint pain and achiness due to that inflammation or maybe excess bloating and just discomfort, which can impact our desire to want to exercise. So all of these things can really be related to that estrogen, lack of estrogen production. And then when you also have that estrogen being a little bit more dominant at any given point than progesterone, that can also be a problem. You've probably heard of estrogen dominance where, yeah, your estrogen is declining in production, but it's also like way out of balance with the other hormones. So all of these things are just kind of like all out of whack. And now you realize in my 20s and in my early 30s, all of these things were so easy. I could exercise and I could see results pretty quickly. Now we have an environment where everything is just a little bit more challenging and it can make that belly fat situation far more challenging. And and we're going to get into, you know, what we can do for the belly fat, but all of those things that I mentioned can all point back to an increase in fat storage around the belly region. That alone is a fantastic thing to understand for women when it comes to these imbalances. But do we know the mechanism by which fat storage in the abdomen increases due to that? We tend to have more of those alpha receptors of estrogen and those sex hormones in the belly fat region. And so when your hormones are a little bit off kilter, those fat storage cells in the fat area, in the belly area, tend to be a little bit more sensitive and they kind of want to hold on to that a little quicker and release it last. So it's kind of that area. And women also tend to have those in the tricep region and in the thigh region. We have a lot of those receptors for that type of hormone fat distribution. So 
those kind of get a little bit more sensitive when your estrogen levels are not as high. Okay. The triceps I, I wasn't aware of, but I, I could, yeah. I could picture that happening in, in older women, you know, when you see that visually, what about, is there any impact on thyroid or metabolic rate independent of the fact your metabolism is affected by all the other things you mentioned? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's tangential, you know, it, it kind of goes side by side with that. A lot of women going through perimenopause and menopause might not have thyroid issues at all. Many of them, that is one of the symptoms of menopause is seeing a change in those thyroid hormone production. So that's where working with your doctor and getting those blood tests taken and seeing your thyroid hormone levels in connection with those other hormonal levels can be really helpful, but not always. So it, it's yes and no. Yeah. It's complicated yeah, as always. It's, it's so complicated. complicated. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so you posted a reel recently on Instagram about four strategies for reducing belly fat. And of course, we know how short form video is. Maybe there's six, maybe there's eight, you know, you may have more than four and you feel free to, we can add to the list. Um, but it was about the science behind belly fat accumulation in women over 40, which we're talking about. And um, I wanted to start with, instead of getting into the four things, are there any other myths or misconceptions on this topic that people will say, maybe the one percenters or even just falsehoods about reducing belly fat before we get into the real things at work? I've come up with three. There are three big things when it comes to the belly fat is first and foremost is like spot training saying, okay, I have an extra accumulation of fat in my belly region. So give me all of the ab exercises that I can possibly find. <laughs> and you can spot strengthen, but you cannot spot reduce. So you, you can't do exercises for one specific region on your body and expect the fat distribution in that region to decrease. However, if you do a bunch of exercises for those particular muscles, those muscles will get stronger. That's how they work. So keeping that in mind, like that is a big misconception. I have a really popular core training program just a simple like five day core tune up. And I, I get a lot of people signing up for it being like, this is really great. I've got a bunch of fat to lose in my midsection. It's like, wait, 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 wait. This is good for that in the long run. But for a different reason, I don't want you to go into it thinking that the intention of this core training program is to get rid of the fat around your belly. It doesn't work like that. So spot training is kind of the, the first thing. And hold on. And, and that different reason, I'm going to guess, is that by having the extra muscle definition, you can reveal it at a higher body fat later on. Correct. And by having a stronger, stable core, in the long run, you're going to be able to train with greater capacity and build that muscle over the rest of your body. So, so yeah, it, it, it's so foundational to everything else you're going to want to try to accomplish. So the second misconception is just straight up calorie reduction. Like I've got excess fat on my body. I got to just keep cutting, cutting, cutting calories back, back, back. And unfortunately, there's a lot of women out there that are only consuming eight or 900 calories a day. And now we have reduced metabolic rate. We have muscles that are shrinking because of it. And it's this like backwards effect. And you get to this point where now I'm spot training really hard on my abs. Now I'm cutting calories like crazy. Why is this not working? Let me add in cardio. That's the other misconception. Right. <laughs> is that the third one? That's the third yeah. one. So adding okay. in more cardio. So that's kind of our go-to in our brain of like, I have fat to lose, so I better like ramp up my cardio. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. Yeah. And, and, and just cut that energy and yeah. go into that, that restricted state. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Understood. Hey, this is Philip, and I hope you're enjoying this guest interview on Wits and Weights. If you're finding it valuable, you can get a bonus conversation we recorded if you're on our email list. Just go to witsandweights.com slash bonus or click the link in the show notes. Insiders on our email list will get a link to the bonus conversation where my guest will give you the exact steps to take related to one of the topics in today's episode. Again, these conversations are only available if you're on our free email list. To get the bonus exclusive content with today's guest, just go to witsandweights.com slash bonus or click the link in the show notes. Now, back to the show. Okay, so that's what doesn't work. Let's go over the four things you talked about. Maybe in the order you mentioned them, I don't know if that's important. 
if the order matters, but the first one was sleep or do you want to reveal these? The first one's sleep. So first I just gave it sleep. away. Yeah. So I think it really does help understanding that what's going on with the belly fat is so hormonally related. And when you understand that, you can say, okay, I can do a little bit more um, thorough approach to attack it. Because we don't, in our brains, we have a hard time understanding that a lack of sleep will impact our belly fat. Like it doesn't make sense. It's hard for us to make that connection. Like if I get a good night's sleep, how is that going to reduce my belly fat? Like that doesn't like directly relate, but it does. Because when you lack sleep, if you're sleep deprived, your body thinks that it's so stressed out and it creates more cortisol and creates this more inflammatory environment especially when you have when your body's bathing in cortisol it loves to hold on to especially belly fat those belly fat receptors are just like really primed to to, to hold on to that visceral type of fat so sleep is really really important the likelihood of someone who gets excellent sleep and also has a significant amount of belly fat is is really low likelihood so Often, if you look at someone who has a lot of belly fat, most of the time they're a very poor sleeper. They might have sleep apnea. They might have sleep disturbances like that or really bad sleep hygiene. And they're very closely related. So sleep is number one. Of getting to the point where you can get between six to eight hours of sleep a night. And yes, hormones do impact your quality of sleep. And I know a lot of women going through midlife feel like, I. This feels so out of my control. I hear what you're saying, but I don't feel like I can get better sleep. The other things that I'm going to mention will circle back and improve your sleep. So even if you feel like I'm doing all the sleep hygiene stuff and I'm still not sleeping well, I'm trying, I really am. These other things will improve your sleep quality too. So sleep is absolutely first. I, I agree. And I there was a study... I've referenced it in the past. I forgot the details of it, but they took two groups, one that was sleep restricted like five or five and a half hours. The other had eight hours and they found two different things. One was when they were in a ad libitum, like calorie surplus, uh, the group that was sleep deprived gained more belly fat Yeah. or I'm sorry, isocaloric. So both groups had the same calories, but they were gaining the group that had the sleep deprivation gained more of that fat in their belly was yep. correlating with what you're saying. And then secondly, when you are allowed to just eat whatever you get a lot hungrier when you have less sleep. So then you gain more weight. So that's just another negative. There's many negatives of poor sleep. We know that. So good. Okay. They're all intertwined. That's sleep. The second one is stress, stress management. So usually when I mention this, someone will say, there are so many things in my life that cause me stress that feel out of my control. And I, I really can't, I can't get rid of these things, whether it's, you know, you're a caretaker for other family members, like that is a burden on your life that could be very stressful. And it's something that you are called to do. Like that's what you have to do. So it's not about getting rid of stresses. Sure. If there are things in your life that you can eliminate, like let's get rid of those. Like, like leave for work 10 minutes earlier. So you stop dealing with the traffic stress, you know, like let's, those little things can help, but it's more about how you manage your stress. When your stress is going unchecked, your body is constantly in this fight or flight response. It's in that sympathetic nervous system environment where it's constantly pumping out those stress hormones. Once again, that cortisol, high levels of, of adrenaline, which, adrenaline in, which yep. directly impact your ability to sleep. If you're going to bed stressed, your body is in a fight or flight response. It's in this like geared up, charged up state, and it's going to impact your sleep. So I always say, let's come up with two, maybe three things that you can do each day to just manage your stress. It doesn't mean that you have to try to eliminate all your stress. We're just going to figure out how to manage it, whether you feel like you need to or not. Those things should be constants every day, whether or not you're stressed out. So that when you hit a season of life that's super stressful, you already have these stress management mechanisms happening routinely in your day. And you're like, I got this. I already have a way to manage my stress. 
So some great ways to do this is getting up a few minutes earlier and just journaling in the morning or reading or praying or thinking, whatever it might be for you. It could be every afternoon I close my computer, I make a cup of tea and I read my book and I take a nap. (laughs) I'm a napper. Mm -hmm. Um, And then every evening I go for about a 20 or 30 minute walk. It's not for fitness, it's for stress. So in my normal life, there's three things I do every single day for stress management, whether or not I actually feel stressed out. So that's what I recommend for people is just like always having these things in your life that just keep your stress levels like at a manageable level. Yeah, I love that. We we recently did an episode about stress and I asked the community, what are all your examples? And it's it's beautiful how many different things people have, whether it's like playing an instrument, yeah. walking on the beach, you know. And of course, all those those of us who lift, lifting is an acute stressor that reduces chronic stress yep. as well. Yeah. Especially apparently when done in the morning, uh, which is an interesting thing. It kind of burns down some of that cortisol. So great ideas. Totally agree. I think the idea of doing something every day consistently, not just because now I'm stressed, let me do this thing, which can be stressful (laughs) to be like, I need to do something to reduce stress can help. And then since you talked about sleep, I don't know if you were going to mention this, but more stress can cause an interruption in your sleep and vice versa. Yep, exactly. Yeah, they really go hand in hand. And then of course, that leads us to the next one. Nutrition. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that plays a role in your belly fat. And the most important things when it comes to having an environment in your body that releases those excess body fat stores and brings you to a good body composition is having good amounts of protein. (laughs) I think we're all protein fans around here. Mm -hmm. Um, And reducing those sugars, processed carbs, processed foods in general. So I always like to attack nutrition from a, what can we add in more of mentality? Like what can we, what can we, yeah, Yeah. additive mentality. So what can we put on your plate? Like more, 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 more. Um, it, it's such an easier way that will start to kind of crowd out the unhealthy foods. So especially women in midlife, this is the number one thing that most women are not getting enough of is protein. And whenever I mention how much a, a good ideal amount of protein is for them, their jaw always drops to the floor. And they're like, <laughs> yeah. but I'm not a bodybuilder. I'm like, but you want to keep muscle on your body. <laughs> Trust me. Yeah, I know. And so usually f- for my goal with women is like, let's, let's just establish a baseline. Let's just get a good idea of kind of how much you're eating now. I think on average, most women I work with are kind of around the 10 grams of protein per meal mark. Um, You know, they'll have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, or they'll have a hard hard boiled egg, or they'll have, you know, something that kind of... One slice of meat on their sandwich, you know, or something. Yeah. Yeah. Or they'll have like a bowl of cereal that's like protein, you know, special K protein. It's like, right, right. oh, wait a second. That has six grams of protein. There'd actually be more protein if you had a slice of bread, you know, than that cereal. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, okay, let's just get a good sense of like where your protein is at now. And then what can we do to add a little bit more in? And then just gradually over time, that way we're not going from, you know, you're used to eating 30 grams of protein a day and we're suddenly to like trying to get over a hundred grams of protein that can feel like a huge leap. It's like, let's just slowly ratchet it up, adding a little bit more, kind of bringing in a higher quality of looking for. I'm I'm already having yogurt. How can I switch from having like regular yogurt to Greek yogurt? That can double it just like that. So so little tweaks of things that you're already eating, what can I do to what I'm already eating to boost that amount of protein naturally? So I'm getting close to that 100 gram a day mark. For a lot of women that's a great threshold to try to get to. Mm-hmm. Um man, if I could get women eating you know, one gram of protein for how much they weigh or their target weight, that would be amazing. It would make huge difference. That's the stretch goal. Yeah. (laughs) On their body, but that can feel like a big leap and that's okay. I understand that. So just figuring out where you're at now and and how to um, just grow that. And then the other side of the plate, produce, load it up with produce as much as you can. And that gives you that fiber that helps slow down your digestion. It just helps your body with inflammation, all the things. So 
One really simple hack that I love on the nutrition side is just think, eat your pros, eat your pros. Every meal, look down at your plate, see protein, produce, protein, produce. Like if you can just operate throughout your life. Oh, that's where that comes from. Okay. I I hadn't looked into that. I thought the pro just meant protein. Now I get it. Protein and produce. It's good. Okay. It keeps it so simple. You know, it makes it so you're not like counting, you know, you're not having to like track things. Like you could go to a restaurant, you can go to a buffet, you can find yourself in all these challenging eating environments and say like, where's the protein? Where's the produce? If it's from the produce department, like that counts. Like, I don't care if it's fruit or vegetables, like just eat it. This is good. Like, yeah. It's so it's a great way to just say, I, I know that if on my plate, I see protein here and I see produce here, I'm doing a pretty good job. And if you go to the grocery store, it starts with produce. Then it's usually the meat department. Yep. Then it's usually dairy and eggs. And that is all your protein right there outside of grains and stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. Genius. Yeah, I love it. I don't know. Oh, I could ask a million questions about nutrition because that's like 90% of what we talk about here. And I know we'll talk about it on your show as well. But uh, two things come to mind. It sounds like you favor a more maybe intuitive and less track approach. I may be wrong because maybe there's different levels depending on the clients you work with. So maybe address that. And then the second thing is vegetarians and vegans. What are what are your advice for them? Yeah. So the first part, um, I always recommend for women to come into it by starting as simple as possible. Like most people are coming from a place of like, I'm so haphazard with my eating. I'm starting at like scratch here. So jumping straight to like more challenging eating skills, like, like tracking and counting calories and counting macros is it's pretty advanced. Like when you're starting from scratch. So I say, let's just start with the how of eating, how to put protein on your plate, how to put produce on your plate how to eat slowly, how to hydrate, how to pay attention to how food makes you feel. We have to start there rather than jumping to more advanced skills. And for a lot of people, that's enough. That gets them to a place where they're really healthy. They feel great. They feel like it's not like taking over their life and they're getting the results that they want. And so if that's the case, it's like, that's awesome. Like there's no reason to do it any harder than that. Occasionally, if you're really consistent with the basics and feel like you do need to dial it up a little bit more, you're not getting the results that you want. It's like, great, let's explore those slightly more challenging things. And that's where we can bring in the tracking. There's lots of ways that we can track that are pretty simple. Like we can just track of, did I have protein today? Mm -hmm. Sure. (laughs) Did I have a splurge today? And I like to just use like simple check marks to start with of like, we don't need to like measure numbers yet. Let's just have an awareness tool first Um, because you might be splurging five days, five times a day and not realizing it. Let's start with that. Like, can we get your splurges? And a splurge would be anything outside of like the protein produce, good healthy fats, good Mm -hmm. whole grains, anything that lands outside of that, just put an X on your chart. How many X's are you getting a day? You know, if can we somehow get that down to mostly check marks and just one X? Awesome. And and yep. maybe that'll get you the results that you want without ever having to count anything. So I always say, let's start with the lowest common denominator. See if that works first before we go to something a little bit more tricky. So then talking towards the, the vegetarian vegan side of things, the protein and produce still works. It's just a lot of your protein mm-hmm. is going to be also produce, <laughs> which is mm-hmm. which right. is kind of great. Fair enough. <laughs> um, my recommendation for more plant based eaters is making sure that, well, understanding that the protein that comes from plants is most often not complete, doesn't have all those nine essential amino acids that your body needs as the building blocks. So. When you're looking at your produce or your protein that goes on your plate, I say pick two. So to keep it really simple, if you're going to put beans in that meal as your protein, also add nuts and seeds. If you're going to have lentils, also have peas. If you're going to have tofu, also add quinoa so that you've got like two sources of Mm -hmm. protein on your plate rather than just one. Because if you do eat animal products, you can get plenty of protein and all the essential amino acids you need from just the one source of protein. 
But if you're more a vegetarian or, or a vegan, you're probably going to be able to cover your bases if you have two plant-based protein sources on your plate. That makes sense. Rice and beans. Yes. <laughs> um, it's it's funny because I, I agree and that's that's often my advice as well. Uh, and the quantity is is harder, a little bit harder sometimes because now you're competing with fats and carbs yeah. in those foods. But I have a colleague, he's a coach. He's he's a plant-based, uh, he's an omnivore, but he prefers a more plant-centric diet. And and he has some debates with me and others, friendly debates about the complete amino acid thing, because he'll show like even just a very sparse plant diet, you can still get your complete amino acids. He likes to show like through all the data, blah, blah, blah. But we have arguments about that. It's fine. I just wanted to mention that. It's really tricky to do. Like that's, you got to really know your stuff. Like you have to really right. know like this plant source has these ones and then this has these ones and then be educated. Yeah. yeah. You have to really be educated and which is cool. If you want to nerd out on that stuff, like yeah. go for it. But for the average individual, it's really challenging. It's really tricky. Yeah. So let, let's get to the fourth one, which is my favorite. <laughs> what is that? Strength training. <laughs> Strength training. So when it comes to belly fat, this is where your brain's like, well, let me just do the things that's going to burn the most calories. Well, okay, yes, makes sense. But what ultimately, what is the thing that will burn the most calories? And it's anything that's going to put muscle on your frame because that is a more thorough approach to having a body that has a faster metabolic rate. And so if you can prioritize strength building or muscle building work, whether that's coming from weightlifting or using your own body as resistance, I always recommend starting with that. Start with just body weight only work first so that you know how to move and control your body without putting things in your hands and having to figure multiple stuff mm -hmm. out at the same time. A lot of people don't think that body weight stuff is strength training. And I'm like, well, think about how heavy your body is. You're pushing and pulling that around. That's resistance. Megan, you don't have to convince me. I just did leg raises this morning. And I'm always <laughs> uh, speaking of ab, ab exercises yeah. that, that are uh, tough. Yeah. Oh, man. Oh, yeah. It, so we can do a really thorough, highly effective resistance training workout without any equipment. So, but just something that keeps you and you know, it's a good strength building routine and muscle building routine. If it kind of stays in the like six to 12 repetition range. And if we're, if we're getting significantly outside of that, like six to 12 repetition range, now we're kind of moving a little bit more in the stamina side, it's not going to create as much mm -hmm. of that hypertrophy in your muscles. So I always say, let's do the body weight only weight, like work first. Let's get confident with those movements. And then let's see how, once you have the confidence, let's see what we can do to keep ratcheting up the load so that it, you keep staying as you're getting stronger, you keep staying in that six to 12 repetition range, which Honestly, for those of us that strength train a lot, that's actually a pretty wide range. I don't know about you, but a workout that has 12 reps feels very different to me than a workout that has six reps. And to be honest, like I'd rather do the workout with the six reps. <laughs> I agree. I mean, people find that out when they do it. They're like, oh, you know what I mean? I'm not just constantly doing all these reps in the gym. No, you're not. It's actually a little bit more fun sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love the, the heavy, the heavy weight, heavier Low reps, heavy loads is my favorite kind of weight training. It's fun. It, it is definitely fun. Yeah, no, I like that six to 12. You know, I've, I've used everything from like, you know, four to six on the strength side to up to 12. And then beyond that, it depends if you have certain bodybuilding programming and specialized stuff you're doing. You did a great episode about this recently. I wanted to mention for the listeners. So you should des definitely subscribe to your podcast, uh, Self Care Simplified, because it wasn't long ago, uh, although probably a couple months for, behind when this comes out. <laughs> that was about strength training, how to get started, you know, how to get started for women. You talked about body weight and then dumbbells and things. So check that out. Um, in the interest of time, I want listeners to know we're going to do um, outside of this episode for those on our email list, you're going to get a, a bonus episode that Megan and I are going to do about the best core exercises themselves. So we're going to save that for that. But like I asked all my guests before we end up, if, is there a question that you wish I had asked and what is your answer? You know, I think a great question, especially when we're talking about making changes to belly fat, is when can you expect to see results? 
I think this is you know, you're starting to like implement the strategies and you're like, okay, when can I expect to see results? I think most of us want to see them right now. (laughs) And I think it's really helpful to have a good understanding of when results actually happen. And I like to go with my rule of threes. So usually once you start doing or implementing a new habit consistently, usually it takes three weeks to feel the benefits of that new habit. So if you're starting a good core training program, usually it takes three weeks to feel your core functioning differently than it had been before. Three months is kind of the next benchmark. At three months of consistently doing a good habit, and I I keep using that word consistent (laughs) because you just, Mm -hmm. you do need to keep showing up and and continually bringing yourself to the table. At three months is usually when those visible results really float to the surface. Usually around that three month mark is when you're like, okay, I can actually see, I can see my muscles now. I can see the fat distribution changing, my body composition changing. Most people like, I want to see, I I want those visible results at the three week mark. It's like, well, maybe, but often no, if you don't see anything yet at three weeks, like you're on track. (laughs) <laughs> like mm-hmm. you're you're not it, you're not doing anything wrong like let's make sure you're feeling a difference like that's a great indication that you're on the right track usually at the three month mark is when people are like okay i can actually my pants are fitting looser around my midsection um and that's to say you know not to say that you won't get some of those results earlier but i like to give people that really realistic timeline expectation because it's like don't judge something in the first three weeks, please. <laughs> like just yep, give advice. it time to settle in and work for you. And then let's make sure that by three weeks, you're starting to feel your body improve. And then around three months, we should be seeing some visible changes. It's probably not going to be this giant change. We're all about no quick fixes around here, but that's a really good benchmark to aim for. And I find that that's really helpful mentally when you're embarking on something that's hard. I love that. Yeah. Three weeks to feel, three weeks to see the muscles or three months to uh, see the muscles. muscles. There is a third benchmark and I am always hesitant to mention this one, but it's actually three years. Three years. (laughs) Yeah, actually. Okay. Three years is when it's now your identity. It usually takes someone of showing up consistently and making their fitness and nutrition a priority where there's something that happens around the three-year mark where it now is so ingrained in who they are that they don't have to think about it anymore. It's just part of their life. So it's so habitual. And so I get a lot of women and men that I work with, you know, in the first year where they're like, why is this still so hard for me to show up? Why do I still need accountability? Why do I still need to be like fighting to make this a priority in my life? Mm. And I'm like, you're on track. Like you haven't reached that three-year mark, you know? You're, yeah. you're still in that baby phase of like, you're, you're, we'll get there right around that three year mark. And I, oh, time and time again, I ask people I work with when they've been at it for three or four years, I'm like, can you imagine your life without this? Like, oh gosh, no. Like, I can't even imagine not doing this. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, I love that. So three weeks to feel, three months to see, and three years to be. Ooh, that's good. Ooh. There you go. Really good. <laughs> I didn't know. I didn't know if you were going to say that or not, but I'm like, that'll fit. That'll <laughs> Be, fit. To become that athlete that we are, uh, are that is core to our identity, and that we are now turning into. Love it. Okay, Megan, where can people learn more about you and your work? Definitely check out my podcast, Self Care Simplified. So we are releasing two episodes a week. Philip, you're going to be on the show same week that this goes live, which will be really cool. So come check that out. I love to break things down in really, really simple ways, make them super approachable. Um, And then definitely over on Instagram. I'm there every day, multiple times a day. You can find me at Megan Dahlman, just my name. Love to come say hi. Perfect. I'll throw those in the show notes as always. Uh, This was awesome. Again, we're going to do a little mini episode that people can catch if they're on the email list. And thank you again for coming on the show. Thank you for having me, Philip. This was fun. Definitely. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Wits and Weights. If you found value in today's episode and know someone else who's looking to level up their wits or weights, 
please take a moment to share this episode with them. And make sure to hit the follow button in your podcast platform right now to catch the next episode. Until then, stay strong. Hey, before you go, I want to let you know about a free resource I have. They are free guides on everything from fat loss to eating out to building muscle to managing hunger to figuring out the best macros for you and more being added all the time. You want to get the most out of these podcasts and your time to look and feel your best, and these free guides will give you a quick and easy way to know what to do. If you want to get your hands on these completely free guides, you can head over to witsandweights.com slash free. That's witsandweights.com slash free to get your free guides and level up your results today.